Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, can you all see me if I sit down? Would you? Yeah, you're all right. Okay, great. Uh, so, thank you very much for inviting me and for showing up uh, in, uh, in these large numbers. And also, thank you for calling this series the Roxa Luxembourg Lectures. It's a real privilege to be even indirectly associated with that name. Because uh, I'm sure many of you know, those of you who are economic students definitely do, but the others also, that she was really a very acute observer of capitalism. Quite apart from all the other revolutionary attributes, her analytical uh, abilities and her ability to assess the nature of the capitalism that she inhabited was quite extraordinary. And I think we really do need some of that ability today because so much of what we're told, so much of the, uh, the mainstream positions on what's going on in Europe or what's happening with Brexit and so on, are um, often just skimming the surface of uh, what the real issues are. So I think it's, it's fairly obvious that European capitalism is in crisis. Now, people will say, oh my god, you guys are always saying capitalism is in crisis. And it's true, some of us are old enough to remember how many times we have seen the final <laughs> crisis of capitalism and all that, right? So, so we have to be careful when we use the word crisis, okay? And, and we can't, we shouldn't be overusing it. So I'm using it advisedly. I'm using it essentially to argue that things cannot continue as they have been, okay? There has been a lot of papering over of the cracks. There have been lots of bandages in the Eurozone, elsewhere. It seems that it's now reaching something like a tipping point and it really cannot continue in precisely the same way. So Brexit is of course was the first kind of shock to the system in the sense of a, ra a rather narrow vote in favor of leaving the European Union from a country that was never really that integrated to begin with, which is also seen as something surprising. But here is an economy that was not as it, it, didn't, it wasn't in the Eurozone, so it didn't have many of those issues which countries that have the common currency do. And it was therefore seen as a big surprise that uh, even in, Europe, in, in Britain there is this perception that being in the Eurozone, uh, European Union is not necessarily an advantage. But we now know, and we of course knew even then, but we know that the problems within Europe go beyond Brexit. Some of them have to do with the way in which the European Union was designed and then thereafter particularly the way the common currency was designed, the Eurozone was designed, which has really meant uh, a right royal mess for the countries in the periphery that uh, we can talk about if you have questions later. But it's also evident that even in the countries not in the periphery, there, there are such major social fractures at the moment that the way the European Union is structured, the kinds of rules that have enabled it to operate in the way that it does, all of these are really under threat. And of course, the, the Gilets Jaunes protests, the Yellow Vest protests, as they're known in France, which again are um, in a way unexpected, but also extraordinary because there's no clear leader, there's no clear uh, you know, they are a kind of spontaneous outburst of, uh, outburst of protests, which again appears to be on a specific issue, a petrol tax, but it's actually much more. It's actually much more to do with uh, the third thing that is mentioned in the title, with the whole issue of austerity, uh, is just one of those examples. We've seen a significant rise of the extreme right in Germany, which many people have thought was the biggest beneficiary of the European Union. Yes, so it's one thing to say that it's countries in the periphery that are feeling the strain and finding that there's a problem. But when the countries at the very heart of the European Union, when in France and Germany there is this amount of disaffection and unrest and unhappiness and willing to go with anti-European kinds of sentiments, then there's clearly some significant issue that is a problem at the heart of that whole specific capitalism. So I think it's worth first taking a step back to understand what exactly is it that I'm talking about when I'm saying European capitalism, or what is the European Union all about? And um, it's, um, if you'll forgive me if I do a little 10 minute potted history just to get the background, because it's important to understand what's going on right now. 
So in a very peculiar way, the European Union is a gift to the United States. Okay? Actually, uh, after the uh, Second World War, when Europe, as you know, had been dramatically affected by the destruction of the World War, and when the Iron Curtain had emerged, when the Cold War was beginning to take shape, etc., uh, the United States saw it in its interest to promote a rapid and extensive recovery in Western Europe. Okay, remember it also is Western Europe capitalism vis-a-vis -vis what was then seen as fairly resurgent socialism led by the Soviet Union. So beginning with the Marshall Plan, which was a very, very large inflow of funds into a relatively small geographical area, and which uh, unlike any of the kind of aid that any of you would have been familiar with in your lifetime, was characterized by speed, scale, and generosity. It was very rapid, and over a four-year period, you got 20 times the total capital of the IMF in that period. Okay, so very, very large, scale, rapidly in a four-year period, and generous. More than half of it was grants, the rest of it was all very low-interest loans. Okay? This actually was very significant in enabling the recovery and reconstruction of Europe. But what is more significant is that along with that, there was a systematic attempt to encourage the Europeans to actually trade with one another. Many of the conditions of those loans actually said you should be trading more with one another. It was a kind of global Keynesianism at one level, but it was a very intelligent global Keynesianism. It was one that really saw the revival of demand and output in these economies as essential for the, for the, percept, for the continuation of capitalism at that time. And this, in turn, led to the uh, Treaty of Rome, which was a, the beginnings of European integration, and which created what we would today call a preferential trading ar arrangement, where you, prefer, you give each other tariff preferences and, and various other things. And of course, from then, we got progressively more and more integration. Okay? Now, at some point in this, Remember, this is also the period of what, what we now think of today as sort of welfare state capitalism, if you like, you know, where partly because of the, the, the way the Second World War worked out, partly because of the emergence of center-left regimes in the United Kingdom, in, in a number of other countries, uh, you actually had, and, and uh, largely because of the perceived threat of Eastern Europe, the Eastern Bloc in general, you had a significant degree of welfareist measures brought in by the states of Western Europe. Okay, so this combination of growing integration combined with these welfareist measures was associated both in Europe and the US with what was then called the golden age of capitalism, a period of stability not stable for the rest of the developing world. Yeah, not for the rest of us, but definitely in the core it was a period of stability, reasonable progress, close to full employment, and significant improvements in the conditions of the working class. Now, somewhere in that period, you actually had, uh, towards the middle of that period, you had uh, the uh, disaffection with that strategy because it led to a tendency to inflation. Working classes were able to maintain their real wages, and then the shocks of the primary commodity price hikes, particularly the oil price producers of the 1970s, you know, when you had the OPEC cartel establishing its uh, power and so on. Those two oil, pro oil price shocks uh, combined with the ability of workers to maintain real wages, which basically meant if prices went up, nominal wages went up as well. Industry-wide bargaining, so that pretty much everybody had to pay equivalent wage hikes regardless of different firms' levels of profitability and so on, all of those actually meant that it became more and more difficult to sustain. The 1980s was then known as this period of global stagflation. Okay, Why? Because you got economic output stagnation, but high inflation rates. And this was really, it was that tension. Uh, Again, those of you who study economics know this. Uh, inflation is not something that comes and happens because of particular things. It's all about the distribution of income. Inflation is all the result of the struggle over income shares. 
So it's one particular group trying to increase its income share, countered by another group that tries to maintain its income share. That is what gives you inflation. Why do we have relatively low inflation in India? Because we have a whole 90% unorganized workers on whom we can pass on the costs. They cannot fight back. So we tend to have lower inflation than, let's say, Latin America, where they fight back with higher wage, nominal wage hikes, and so on. Okay, uh, this period of stagflation in Europe actually gave rise to a strategy which we would now identify as neoliberal. In other words, the seeds of that strategy, which are associated with the rise of global finance, certainly, but also with an attempt to curb inflation, really by curbing the power of the working class. Okay? This is what characterizes the period of the 80s, Reagan and Thatcher you all know about, but it's happening also in the rest of Europe, in continental Europe as well at the time. Ironically, this is the period uh, where the neoliberalism also opens the borders, okay, in terms of capital flows and so on. Ironically, this is that period where because you are trying to reassert control, I mean, in a sense, what has happened in capitalism? Workers have got too uppity. So that's threatening the stability. Yes? And so the, the need to control that partly is associated with the unleashing of global finance. Because remember, even that, this unleashing of global finance, is not just something that happens. It's not just, you know, a bizarre thing that came or a tsunami that just happened. It is a policy choice. These are economic policy choices which reflect a particular political economy. And so the rise of finance itself you can link with the, the whole need to control the working classes, which you know, was, in a sense, the, the impact of that near full employment situation of, of that welfareist capitalist, uh, welfare capitalism phase. Okay. But then the rise of finance gives you other problems. And particularly once you allow for cross-border movements of capital, it creates all kinds of instability. Yeah? Because capital moves for all kinds of reasons, as we know in India, right? We know that even when you have much higher interest rates and you have higher profit, profit rates, capital can move simply because Ben Bernanke decides that he might, two years from now, do something about quantitative easing. And then capital will leave. In other words, capital is, is very mobile for all kinds of peculiar reasons. The Europeans discovered this to their cost, that capital is also extremely mobile within Europe. So here you've got a common market. You have a customs union, which is to say that you have zero tariff within the union. And you think you've got these stable relationships, but it's all then massively messed up by the exchange rate. And the exchange rate is volatile because capital flows because capital moves around a lot. Now, because of this, it's what is called the monetary policy trilemma. You can't actually have a stable exchange rate at capital flows and an independent domestic monetary policy. You can't have all three. If you've decided that you're going to have capital flows, then frankly, you can't have any of the other two. <laughs> you're more or less beholden. So, then there was an attempt within Europe to actually somehow resolve that problem by creating some degree of stability in the monetary mechanism. It was called the EMS, the European Monetary System, and it was known as the snake. Why? Because, you know, they were, every currency was fixed uh, within a kind of band, okay, uh, with the other currencies, so that when it moves, it could move like a snake. You could move within a, a, a two and a half percent band of, of the value of that currency. This got attacked uh, in 1989, I think. Way back, that's when George Soros really made his name, fame, and money. Uh, is when he was instrumental in attacking the British pound and the Spanish uh, peso and I forget one other currency. Three, uh, perhaps the Irish. Anyway. Uh, and more or less forced the snake to get abandoned. Okay, so in other words, that monetary policy trilemma, which they tried to resolve by announcing that we're going to more or less create this stable relationship, it didn't work. Because when capital decides that it's not going to be sustained, it can become self-fulfilling. Capital flows will be sufficient to actually force you to get out of that fixed relationship. So, uh, 
the UK had a very significant devaluation at that time, so did the other countries. This actually strengthened the resolve of these other countries to get into a firmer relationship. In other words, the move towards a fixed common currency actually get accelerated. Because they say, well, you know, if we have one currency, they can't speculate against individuals. It turns out you can. We'll come to that one, but it turns out you can. Uh, once you have free capital flows, actually your life is messed up whichever way you look. Okay? So, what actually then happened to the European Union? Essentially, Europe moves from being broadly driven by a kind of welfare capitalism towards an essentially neoliberalism, a neoliberal capitalism. And the, the way the European Union was formulated, it was explicitly corporate driven and neoliberal in its design. Okay, I think that's very important to remember. That there are many good things about the European Union. I have good friends of mine who are you know, deeply invested in the European Union because they are old enough to actually believe that if you don't have that, you have war. So there are, there are many good things about the European Union. I'm not suggesting that, you know, but there's no doubt that in its design, it is a deeply neoliberal project, okay? How did they actually design that, uh, 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 agree that countries can be members? The Maastricht Treaty, I suppose all of you have um, heard of that, uh, establishes certain rules, okay? And of course, like so much of what goes on in the world nowadays, what it says is in fact the opposite of what it does, okay? So in terms of fiscal policy, they have what is called the Growth and Stability Pact, okay? That's actually anti-growth and quite unstable. But it's called the Growth and Stability Pact. What does it say? It says you cannot run a fiscal deficit of more than 3% of GDP. Okay? Now, everybody thinks that, yes, yes, that's how it should be. Yeah? If you look at Indian budgets, everyone is saying, oh, how far have we got beyond 3%? Somehow, 3% is a magic number. Yeah? There's zero, zero argument for why. Why 3%? Why not 2.5? Why not 3.5? Why not 4.1? Why not 1.2? No economic analysis for why 3% is okay. Some European Union bureaucrat must have written that on a restaurant napkin and we're stuck with it. And we're globally stuck with it. Okay? So 3% fiscal deficit, 60% um, public debt to GDP ratio. Once again, absolutely no economic rationale for this. Just to give you one example, uh, the um, Japanese public debt to GDP ratio is 140%. At the moment. Now Japan is stagnating, but is, is the Japanese government debt under pressure? No. Right? Is, is everybody rushing out away from Japanese treasury bonds? No. Okay. Do numbers of, fisc of public debt to GDP matter? Only because markets decide that they do. Okay? Spain, you all probably know that Spain is one of the European periphery countries that had a huge problem and is still limping back to the levels it achieved in 2010, okay? Spain had a public debt to GDP ratio of 53%. So well below the 60% guideline. Germany, the strongest economy of the European Union, the one that is acting tough on everybody else, giving everyone a hard time saying, you know, cut your spending, etc. Public debt to GDP, 58%, more than Spain. Okay? So these numbers have absolutely economic, uh, zero economic rationale. There is no theoretical argument for establishing these numbers, you can argue you shouldn't have an exploding public debt. But that has to do with your debt relative to your, you know, the rate of return on your investments. And that will vary in different situations. There's no such you know, given. But anyway, 3% of GDP is your fiscal de uh, deficit ratio, 60% is your limit. Now, this is inherently what is called pro-cyclical. That is to say, it will make economic cycles worse. When you're in a downswing, you'll get less tax revenue, but you'll have to spend less because you have less tax revenue, so you, you know your maximum is your 3% limit and so on. In an upswing, you will be spending more. It will actually amplify business cycles. That's number one. But of course, number two point is that what does it do? It encourages governments to cheat. Yeah? You basically shift a lot of your spending off budget. So another proof of the fact that this 3% of GDP 
ratio is meaningless is that all the big countries have actually never held to it. Germany, when it joined, you know, just after Maastricht, it was given this two-year period, um, it goes from 5.2% of GDP to 3%, bam, overnight. How does that happen? Because you shift all the spending to off-budget. Okay? In India, how do we get our fiscal deficit numbers? The government doesn't pay the Food Corporation of India, it doesn't pay and then, you know, the, the um, employment guarantee, it doesn't pay a whole bunch of other people who are supposed to be paid. It does not, it makes public sector enterprises buy each other through so-called privatization and then it gets these numbers, okay? That's not, act I mean, it basically it's a cheat. So, these, but, Despite the fact that it's a cheat, what is the implication it has? It has an implication in terms of dampening public spending. Okay? So if you have to identify any one thing, which is the, the root cause of Europe's problems, it is essentially this dampening effect on public spending, for which the summary word is austerity. Okay? That's the one kind of easy way of putting what's going on in Europe, what's the, the core, what is the original sin, what's the problem, it's fiscal austerity. And the reason for that fiscal austerity, some of it is in the very design of the European Union, some of it is in the way neoliberalism practices occur, which is to say that everyone's obsessed with the fiscal deficit number. So, in a few days from now, our budget will be presented and you can bet every television channel will be looking for that magic number. Yeah, is it 3.4, is it, oh my god, it's 3.7, and you know, that kind of thing will happen, yeah? Uh, so, this obsession with the fiscal deficit number, what is the underlying thing? And you know, Rosa Luxemburg is very into this, the underlying, what's, what's actually going on in this? What is actually going on is precisely this thing, curtail public spending. Because remember, the other aspect of neoliberalism is that you can't tax. Okay, you tax corporations, they say, oh, we're moving. Your tax rates are too high, we're moving on. Okay? You tax individuals, they don't pay. They put their money in Panama or wherever. You know? Or they buy jewels and take them in their suitcases when they leave. Whatever. <laughs> uh, so you cannot tax. And if you, see, if you are seen as an aggressive tax collector, then you're almost setting yourself up for failure. Then financial markets punish you, Multinationals punish you, everybody punishes you, so you cannot really survive, okay? So you can't tax. And then you can't spend because you've got that fiscal deficit limit. Mm. Even with the cheating, even granted that you're not paying, you know, your, act, your fiscal deficit might be actually double of what you say it is, you can't really go beyond that. There is a limit to that spending, okay? What does that in turn mean? It means that government's abilities <coughs> to deliver in terms of the basic social and economic rights of citizens is hugely curtailed. In other words, you can't do the welfare capitalism that you had been doing. You can't do that anymore. That's really the big difference. And that is very big in the European Union because that was a very major plank of the way those economies were structured and the way those economies actually succeeded. Because, you know, the thing about welfare spending, it's not just that it, it's good for people and it improves income distribution and you know, all of that. It actually creates demand. It creates more employment because you're employing more people in public services. It creates more incomes in the hands of the poor. And because workers and poorer people have a higher propensity to spend, it generates more effective demand for every additional bit of public spending. So you're actually getting, if you like, a kind of virtuous cycle of demand creation simply through those welfare spending. You reduce those, you don't have that anymore. Yeah, you get the opposite. You get negative multiplier effects. You cut your spending, people lose jobs, people lose wage incomes. They can, uh, they can spend less. And eat of it because you're worried about the future. So you do not get the demand generation. So... Basically, three things happened with this shift towards fiscal austerity, which is now dominant across Europe, which is inbuilt into the design, but remember all of that design and everything, these are political economy choices. 
These are not inevitable, these are not written in stone somewhere, these are all political economy choices. Okay? And it's really a sign of how much people can be conned by what you're told is the kind of inevitability of an economic process. So there were these implications. The first implication, as I mentioned, is that governments could not spend, which had direct and indirect effects on effective demand. And that in turn means that employment levels were much lower than they could have been. Okay? So then people turn around and blame globalization and so on. We'll come to that in a minute. But that's really what was happening. Employment levels were low because macroeconomic policy determined that. The second implication is that, you see, a lot of that welfare kind of spending is redistributive, right? And which is why in Europe especially, the primary distribution of income, which is, you know, between wages and profits and rents, and the secondary distribution, that is after taxes and subsidies and public spending, those were quite different. There was sometimes as much as a five percentage point difference in the Gini coefficient. Okay, those of you who are not economists, what does it mean? It means that inequality was significantly lower after taxes and public spending and subsidies. Okay? Why? Because of the fact that a lot of that public spending was inherently redistributed. Okay? There would be um, things that directly cater, whether it's health and education and you know, housing for the poor and sanitation and so on. There would be public services. There would be... Uh, uh, education grants or scholarships, there could be child support, there could be elderly pensions, you know, all kinds of things which would actually redistribute income. That capacity has come down hugely. Now in the European Union, the difference between the primary and secondary distribution of income has really shrunk. Okay? In other words, it's not doing that job. And in some countries, it's still good in Scandinavia and elsewhere, but in some countries like Greece, and Portugal, and, you know, the ones that have really been given the big whammy by that whole crisis. It is almost negative. In other words, now the, the poor are disproportionately paying taxes and not getting public services. Because a lot of the taxation is indirect, and a lot of the public services that used to be available are not available. Okay? I'm not going into the human tragedies associated with this. But there are, I mean, we can talk about it. If you have questions, I'm sure you all know about it. There are incredible kinds of uh, extreme human tragedies associated with that kind of fiscal austerity. But the third thing, and this is where Brexit, migration, and all of these issues become significant. The third thing that happened is that when this happened, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing a conspiracy theory, I'm not suggesting that there's a bunch of people sitting out there who are deciding it all, but let's face it, when all of this happens, you need a scapegoat. Yeah? You don't want it to be identified that fiscal austerity is the problem, because then you can actually demand a change away from fiscal austerity. Okay? So what are the scapegoats that have been identified? Globalization, for sure. Okay? And globalization in two ways. In terms of trade openness that has made all those Indian and Chinese workers take away all, our, all the jobs, that's, uh, that is such a widespread perception, I cannot describe it to you. And it's a, a widespread perception across working classes. Okay? The working class in Europe and the United States is convinced that all of us in India are really doing really well. There is full employment in India and we're, I mean, that we're all, wages are rising like anything and you know, China, don't even ask. You know what I mean? Uh, Etc. Okay? Uh, and migration. Okay? But then there are all these fellows coming in and taking our jobs directly. Bad enough they're taking them through trade, now they're coming in and taking these jobs directly. Okay? So that's number one scapegoat, and this is a scapegoat which is actually, actively, uh, shall we say, propagated by the mainstream media. Uh, we know how this is done in India, right? We have seen the way a lot of the mainstream media has been talking about Bangladeshi infiltration and all of that kind of thing. So we know how this is done. Globalization and the other scapegoat that is found is technological change. Okay. The fourth industrial revolution. It's going to come and take away everybody's jobs. It's not just, you know, the unskilled workers. Now you skilled workers, you're finished. Everybody's jobs will go because of 
artificial intelligence, because of robotization, because of you know advanced level automation. So just forget it, no jobs going. Okay? Be lucky you have a job. What is the it's not it's not a surprise that this message comes from Davos, from the World Economic Forum, which is meeting as we speak. Huh? Why? Because you know what's the subtext of that message? Don't you dare open your mouth to working class. You're just lucky to have a job at all. <laughs> yeah? Because Technology can come and replace you. Now, this is farcical and it's wrong. We can have a discussion about that later on, but these are basically the two scapegoats. Now, technological progress, somehow we are told we can't do anything about it all. It's there coming at us, right? But the other stuff, you can. So the whole anti-trade response in Trump's United States and the whole anti-migration response in Europe is actually directly a result of this diversion of public frustration with fiscal austerity into blame the other. And of course, it's much easier to blame another. You can actually turn around and bash another, right? You can't bash the system. It's out there. It's too big. Just like here, it's easy to identify Muslims and then create a riot. It's, you can bash, you know? They're available. They're around you. They're not bigger and stronger than you are. A system is a much more difficult thing and therefore, it's easy to identify migration as a huge issue. Okay, so then let's look at, so this is, if you like, the crisis of capitalism. Now, why is it a crisis? I'd come back to that issue. Because, let's face it, the real problem is lack of demand. The real problem is lack of demand. That's why employment rates are low. That's why, but you cannot revive that demand because of this whole pressure on containing the workforce, okay? So you are, you're in a kind of bind. The only way you can survive is by exporting. Okay, the European Union to stay as a viable economic entity, as one entity, has got to keep generating export surpluses. In other words, Germany has to make all the rest of Europe like itself. And it succeeded, huh? Germany managed after 2010 to force the peripheral countries also to start generating export surpluses. Today, Europe is a net exporter. And it is a larger net exporter than China. Everybody blames China. China today is barely a net exporter. It's about current account balance. Huh? <coughs> Germany and the rest of the European Union are net exporters. Okay? That's the only way it can survive as an entity because it does not have, it's not generating sufficient internal demand. So that's why it's a crisis, because that can only last for so long. In fact, it's not lasting, because now the whole global economy is in recession. People blame the trade war between Trump and Xi Jinping. I mean, that's, these are all, if you like, the kind of the noise in the system, okay? The underlying problem is this inability to generate effective demand. You could do it if you did globally coordinated expansion, you know, Keynesian kind of expansion. Just after the global crisis, they did it, the G20 immediately after, but global capital didn't allow that to last for too long. There was too much a threat. So you're back in that mire. Okay, there's really no answer they have to that. If you don't have an answer, what happens? There is frustration, there is unhappiness, there's growing inequality, of course. I mean, much more, in, the more people talk about inequality, the, the worse it gets, very clearly. You know, after all, the, the Occupy movement, 99%, we are the 99% against the 1%. The share of the 1% has tripled after Occupy, okay, <laughs> according to the latest World Inequality Report. So, clearly, there is frustration, there is unhappiness. What do you do? You direct it against migrants. And it's very interesting that this ability to direct against migrants it's, it's always, I'm not going to suggest a strictly economic reasoning only, okay? Because it's, the point is that it gets, it gets enmeshed with various social, cultural, and other things. It's always easier to blame migrants, especially when they look different, they talk different, they eat different, they smell different, I've been told that, you know, etc. So it's easier when you have all these differences. And we know that in India too, yeah? We know that, you know, we are certainly no angels when it comes to even interstate migration. 
uh, Biharis who have been periodically forced out of Mumbai will know this better than anyone. Okay, um, so you turn against migration. Now, the, the peculiar Brexit, in fact, ultimately was really all about migration. And here's the funny thing, it was not, when you talk to the, the sort of most ardent Brexiters, they're really not worried about migration from Europe. Yeah. I mean, a little bit is from Poland and so on, but not much. Most of the migration they're worried about is people like us, right? All the brownies and yellowies and you know, blackies and etc. They're not really, but, but you can't express it any other way. Okay? Here's the other funny thing. The most anti-migrant sentiment is in regions where there is the least migration. This is true across Europe. Okay? In Britain, it's the northern belt where there are hardly any migrants because there are hardly any jobs. So migrants don't go where there are no jobs. Yeah, they hang around in London and South England and so on. Where there is actually no anti-migrant or much less anti-migrant sentiment. Okay? In Germany, it's East Germany which has the strongest anti-migration, the strongest <laughs> rise of the AFD. Again, fewer migrants because there are fewer jobs. There's fewer dynamism, there's, you know, etc. Uh, Austria, it is those pockets of Austria which uh, were the least affected by migration, which have the strongest anti-migrant sentiment. I have to tell you though, you know that uh, we hear a lot about migration into Europe. It's tiny by global standards, okay? They're just making a very big noise about it. It's really very, very small by global standards. It's not even, I think it's just about hitting 1% of the population in Germany today. Mm -hmm. huh? Which is nothing, absolutely nothing. To give you some indicator, uh, the country with the largest migration, uh, ref refugees, yeah. the country yeah. with the largest refugees, Turkey. Lebanon. Lebanon. One third of One the population third, yeah. of Lebanon population is, wise, yeah. yes. Absolute it's, numbers is Turkey. Absolute numbers yeah. is Turkey, but in terms of the population, yeah, yeah, yeah. one third of your population is refugees. Do, do you ever hear Lebanon exploding because of migration? No. So, so essentially what is it? It is the deeper economic frustration. You don't have a job, you have terrible prospects, your children have even worse prospects than you do, and are likely to face declining real income. There is no uh, possibility of secure incomes for them, all the jobs available are extremely fragile, very low paying and uncertain and very little prospect for advancement. So you're upset, angry and so you blame these forces which you feel you can still control. Okay. You do not blame austerity, remarkable, but you don't actually or rather not enough people blame austerity so that you still don't get the political um, shall we say, push to remove austerity, to actually enable fiscal expansion and coordinated fiscal expansions, which Europe could easily do. So you don't get that pressure, and then you get these kinds of responses. Now, in a way, I think what is most remarkable in what is going on in Europe is the sheer stupidity of the elite. Okay. Uh, why do I say sheer stupidity? Because if you are an elite with a sort of medium term vision, forget long term, I and mean, I forget even medium term in terms of global warming and all that, I'm not even going there. Okay? If you are an elite with a minimal recognition of the need to survive in the medium term, you recognize the need for legitimacy. Yeah? And where you see those cracks, then you do things to actually respond to those cracks. And then, you know, um, that, that wonderful um, novel by Lampedusa, right? It's necessary to change in order to remain the same. Yeah. So you change. You change a little bit so that you can preserve the assets of that capitalism. That would be what a smart elite is doing. The European elite seems crazy. Okay. So, for example, here you have in Italy a coalition run by the Northern League and the Five Star Movement, which is demanding an easing of fiscal austerity of the rules. And the European Union and Germany in particular have gone rigid and said, no way we're going to let this happen. You are not allowed to do it. We will not allow you. Now, this is really a recipe for disaster. It is asking for a dissolution of that union. It is creating political conditions in which people are going to say, 
We don't want this union. Now if Italy actually gets a government that is saying we don't need a union, you can imagine what is going to happen to that union. So in a sense, for me, the, the surprise in terms of, you know, um, the, uh, the current con configuration in Europe is precisely this, is that recognizing everything that is wrong, you still get these Macrons and this, you know, these ECBs and these German rulers, etc., who don't recognize that you have to change to stay the same. Yeah. Even cynically, from the, I'm not saying that you know I, I don't want them to, but I'm saying they don't seem to recognize it. They seem to be going for broke. So I would say if that political configuration continues, then in fact, European Union's days are numbered. If it's a very big if. But clearly, it's a tipping point. You cannot carry on with this particular combination for more than five years, six years. Something will actually emerge to break it. Does it mean, I mean, again, you know, we all loved this last crisis of capitalism because we thought that everything would become very good. We know that that's not true either. Okay? In other words, a collapse of a system doesn't mean that it's all going to be all wonderful and hunky-dory and progressive and so on. It can release the most vicious and terrible kinds of social and um, political tendencies which don't look pretty at all, okay? So it doesn't follow that that breakdown is going to generate something very positive. Um, I should stop, but I'll just say, you know, there is um, this German uh, political thinker, Wolfgang Streck, possibly some of you have uh, read, uh, who has a book called How Capitalism Dies. And it's very interesting. Basically, he's saying that capitalism is actually dead. It's actually dead. It's just that there's nobody around to move that dead body out of the way. <laughs> you know, so in, in a way, we're all kind of, you know, uh, in this kind of no man's and no woman's land of a system that is dysfunctional, but a clear alternative and a progressive alternative is not being able to emerge. Okay, that's a depressing note to end, but maybe we can have a discussion.